Okay, so everyone, welcome to our second February Memory Lab Network webinar um, since we didn't have one in January. Um, we are so, I feel just that we are so, so lucky um, to have Michelle Caswell here with us today while she's on sabbatical, no less. <laughs> um, to talk with us about UCLA's Community Archives Lab and then their toolkit that they recently put out assessing the effective impact of community archives. So with that, I would, Michelle, I'll, I'll throw yep. it over to you and then um, you can tell us everything about it and then we'll yep. ask questions afterwards. Great. Thank you so much, Siobhan. Thank you all for being here. I'm so excited to talk to you. Um, we put the toolkit up a couple months ago, and then you never know when you put something online if it will take off or not, and I was so glad to see it being retweeted, and this is actually the first time I'm presenting it, so um, thank you all for being guinea pigs. Um, so I am um, an associate professor at UCLA in the Department of Information Studies. I also have a joint appointment in Asian American Studies, and I'm the director of the UCLA Community Archives Lab, which is really... Um, a codification of the kind of community-based research that I've been doing for a while. Um, I should also mention that I'm the co-founder of a community-based archive, the South Asian American Digital Archive, or SADA, and I'll talk more about that in just a second. So um, today's agenda, I'm going to give you some background on the project and um, give you some really detailed information about the research that my team and I have been doing on theoretical concepts like symbolic annihilation and representational belonging. Um, I'll talk a little bit about creating the toolkit and then testing the toolkit, and I'll go step by step through all of the processes of the toolkit. Um, and then we'll have some feedback or discussion at the end. But this is really informal, so feel free to ask questions throughout if you're muted. I think there's also a chat box that you can chat in. Um, really do not hesitate to interrupt. Um, I've been doing this for years and sometimes I get like ahead of myself and really in my own world. So um, no question is a bad question in that regard. Um, so this is the website of UCLA's Community Archives Lab. We have two main projects going on. The first is assessing the affective impact or emotional impact of community archives. And that is the result of an IMLS early career grant that is wrapping up in October of this year. And that project includes both the toolkit and basic empirical social science research on the impact of community-based archives. And then the second um, project we have are Mellon Foundation-funded internships. So we're placing over the course of three years, 24 of our second year MLIS students in paid internships at community-based archives. So the idea is the students really need the practical experience and they love working for community archives, but they love to get paid. And the community archives love having student labor, but they don't have the money to pay students. And so we somehow finagled away for the Mellon Foundation to step in um, and pay for it. So that's our other big project. And that's the first year of three years that we're in right now. So taking a step back, I wanted to talk very briefly about what are community archives. Um, UK-based scholars, um, Andrew Flynn and others, have defined community-based archives as collections of materials gathered primarily by members of a given community and over whose use community members exercise some level of control. Um, I think this is a good sort of first shot of a definition, but I think in the American context, we can talk about community-based archives as being um, identity-focused and really centered around or coalescing around marginalized identities whether those identities are based on race or ethnicity or geographic location or sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, so I like to say marginalized identity-based community archives, even though that's kind of clunky. Um, and the community archives in the US exist on a continuum, I would say. Some are completely independent, their own nonprofit 501c3 organizations. Some are part of public libraries, as I'm sure you all are aware, and some are part of universities. So there's no single configuration or no single recipe that makes something a community archive, I think, um, except that these um, ideas of autonomy and participation. So I think what makes a community archive a community archive is that community members have autonomy in deciding what to collect, how to collect it, 
to digitize it or not, how to describe it. Um, and so that community participation is key. Um, so as I said, 11 years ago, I'm also the co-founder of a community-based archive, the South Asian American Digital Archive, which I co-founded with Samit Malik, who's been the executive director of the organization um, for the past 11 years, but for the past six years um, on a full-time paid basis. Mm -hmm. um, and South Asian American Digital Archive is a post-custodial archive. So what we do is we borrow materials from individuals, from families, from archives, from community organizations. We digitize them. Um, we make them accessible online, and then we return them. And then we have a number of projects um, that are really trying to activate the records that we have. So um, we just had a big event at UCLA where we brought together the um, descendants of early South Asian immigrants to California. So people whose grandparents or great grandparents came to California from India um, in the 19 early 1900s with scholars and activists and artists who use those materials. Um, so I have both of these hats on constantly, the researcher hat and the community-based archive hat. And I'm always trying to find a way to make those two hats um, work together. To, I, I don't know if hats can work together. I don't know if the metaphor <laughs> works. But um, to, to wear both of those hats at the same time and, and make, um, make it work. So through my work with SADA, I can, we had a practical problem, which is how do we talk about our impact? Um, it's really hard to communicate the importance of a community-based archive, of documenting the past, of telling stories about the past, um, and in particular when you're online only, when you're just a digital project, it's really hard to demonstrate what that impact is. So we have all these quantitative numbers, and these are just a little, uh, you know, a little smidgen of them. They're a little bit outdated. Um, of, of the kinds of quantitative measures we have, right? So we know how many records we have in the collection, how many people like us on social media, what our annual budget is. 95% um, of our annual budget um, is from individuals. So I think last year, 382 individuals made a gift to SADA, which to me is a really important number that shows a great deal of impact. Um, but none of those numbers really get at our impact in changing people's lives, right? Um, and I think those quantitative numbers don't, they just don't do that quite as well as qualitative data does. Um, so I, a few years ago, oh, four or five years ago, I started to think about how do we measure the qualitative impact, right? So the impact um, using words of, of what we do. And then at the same time, I came across this concept, um, which is not, it's not my concept. It's um, from Gay Tuchman and other feminist communication scholars from the 1970s and 80s. The concept is symbolic annihilation, which is the ways in which members of marginalized groups are absent, grossly underrepresented, maligned, or trivialized by mainstream media. And when I first um, saw this term, I think the hair sort of stood up on my arm because it um, really resonated with me and resonated with what I knew to be true for many people from marginalized communities um, who had gone to look for people who look like them or members of their community in archives and either not found anything or found records that were um, gross misrepresentation, right? So police records or records of state intervention um, and not any records created by community members themselves. Um, so over the course of the past four years, um, I've developed three different empirical social science projects to figure out more about does this concept resonate with members of marginalized communities? Do community-based archives counter those feelings? How can we begin to understand what the impact of community archives are on, on countering those feelings of symbolic annihilation. So there were three different but very related research projects that sort of went into this. Um, the very first project focused very narrowly just on SADA. So in 2015, with two of my doctoral students, Marika C4 and Mario H. Ramirez, we did 11 in-depth semi-structured interviews with SADA's Academic Advisory Council. And the Academic Advisory Council are South Asian American um, academics, some in history, but some um, in different fields in the humanities who use SADA. And so we interviewed them about their experiences with SADA. The second um, major research project was the following year. And that was more broad on um, looking to see if what we found with those 
um, South Asian American academics resonated more broadly um, with founders, archivists, and volunteers at community-based archives at 16 different sites in Southern California. So those first two projects were interview-based. And then the third project was based on focus groups. So from November 26 to May 2017, working with a team of graduate students, we did 10 different focus groups at five different community archive sites in Southern California. So it was a total of 54 people who participated. Um, and they were community members who were who served um, who were served and represented by um, these community archive sites. And just in just a minute, I'll give you some detailed quotes about um, what, what everybody said to us in these interviews and focus groups. So in all three cases, our research question is, what is the affective or emotional impact of community archives on the communities they serve and represent? So we did these interviews and focus groups. We recorded them with the permission of the participants. We transcribed them, or in some cases had them transcribed. Um, we, uh, in some cases, hired a service to do that for us. We coded them for themes, and I'll go over what exactly that means. It's in the toolkit as well. Um, the aim of all of this was to get a thick description of the social phenomenon, right? So I don't think we're trying to make any sort of generalized claims or say that um, that the people who uh, participated in the interviews or focus groups are statistically significant. Um, it's it's a, a convenient sample for sure. And our ultimate goal here is to generate theory about a phenomenon about which little had been known, um, rather than sort of make sweeping generalizations about all communities everywhere because we just we just don't know. Um, um, so the sites were, um, the first project was SADA, the second project was 16 different sites, which are too many to list, and the third project, the sites were the Little Tokyo Historical Society, Lambda Archives um, in San Diego, which is a gay and lesbian archive, the Southeast Asia Archive at UC Irvine, and La Astoria Society in El Monte, California, which is um, a Chicano farm laborers archive, and then finally the LA History Archive, um, which is organized by the Studio for Southern California History in Pasadena. Um, some practicalities. Um, we recruited participants via the archivist or staff. Um, sites were compensated $500 each, and I think that's really important to um, to note because for community archives, there's often an extractive research practice that happens. So it's important to compensate the community archives um, for their labor. Um, and the participants themselves were compensated with $15 Amazon gift cards, which isn't a lot, but it was sort of the most that we could finagle. Um, of the 54 focus group participants, 51 gave us permission to cite them by name. And that was really important to us to acknowledge um, the kind of labor that goes into um, uh, generating the knowledge um, that, that, that the focus groups um, produced. Um, and so again, we recorded and transcribed the focus groups, we coded them, we considered um, the transcriptions to be our data. So some complications. Um, in this uh, last research project with the 54 focus group participants, we originally set out to study the users of community archives. And then we soon realized that the line between community members, users, donors of materials, volunteers, board members, staff is all permeable, right? So people occupied many different roles. They weren't just users um, of community archives. Um, there was also some complications with um, myself and my research team our insider outsider status to the community archive site. So in some of the sites, some of us were insiders and in other sites we were clearly outsiders. Um, so at one, one case in a focus group at the Little Tokyo Historical Society right after the presidential election, um, you know, uh, myself and another researcher who were clearly not part of the Little Tokyo Historical Society community, um, someone came up to us, saw us at the board meeting and said, are you spies? Right, which is a completely valid question to ask us. And so certainly our positionality colored um, the kind of uh, data we were able to collect. Um, and I think another challenge is that in empirical social science research, there's a trend to, to generalize. Um, and to, to make sort of larger um, uh, analyses between the different organizations, when really each of these communities is very different, their histories are different, the history of and the practices of each organization is different. So then it's a bit of a challenge about um, how to talk about these different organizations 
across differences without collapsing important differences between the sites. Um, so I'm going to read for you now some really detailed quotes that we got from some of these interviews and focus groups um, to give you a sense of, of what the participants said. And the participants were amazing and brilliant and said incredible things, way smarter than I could say. So um, I'm going to read to you some of these quotes because it's um, great to, to get this uh, sense of impact in their own words. So the first thing we found out that, yes, this concept of sim uh, symbolic annihilation in mainstream media did resonate with many of the interview subjects and focus group participants. Um, so Annie Tang, who at that point was a volunteer for the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California, who's Chinese American, said, representation to me is incredibly important because growing up as a child, you rarely see Asian Americans in mainstream media. When you're a kid, that's the easiest way that you can see what the world looks like. And when you don't see anyone that looks like you, you think, is there something wrong with me? Why are people like me missing in the world? Right, so this sense of not seeing yourself represented, right? So nobody said, I felt symbolically annihilated, um, but clearly the things that they said uh, made it clear that that concept resonates with them. Um, and not just in mainstream media, but in archives. And so this is a quote from Tuivo Dang, who's the archivist at the Southeast Asian Archive at UC Irvine. I wanted to write a thesis about Vietnamese American literature, and this was the late 1990s. And at the time, I remember my professor saying, what's that, and where would you even find primary sources or any literature produced? So I had to do a lot of work to try to find that material. I feel like I really had to figure things out um, through, I kind of stitched together a variety of different sources in order to make it work for my research. And there wasn't one repository that I could go to or even any kind of centralized site of knowledge, really. In many ways, it was also very demoralizing because I saw that none of this history was that important to many people, that I had to make a case for it all the time. If there had been an archive to back me up, to give me legitimacy, I wouldn't have had to fight as hard. There were many times when it just felt very discouraging, um, when I felt like, I don't think I can do this, there's just not enough support, right? And so you get a sense of that emotional frustration um, in not seeing yourself represented and having to fight and struggle um, when those archival collections aren't readily available. And then here's another quote. This is from Kelly Besser, who's the founder of something called the Transgender Living Archives. And Kelly said, I went into an LGBT repository, and what I found there in transgender history was devastating. Our materials weren't being preserved. They weren't cataloged. They weren't described. So literally when I found some boxes, what I found were like records of death that were crumbling in my hands. So death and pathology, women dying, trans women dying, and then being identified in publications such as newspapers by the names that they hadn't chosen for themselves, which were their legal names. And then the sort of medicalization, the pathological terms used by the medical establishment to sort of describe them as crazy or unstable. They weren't records of lives worth living, basically. So it's a lot of abuse, women getting beat, arrested for cross-dressing, picked up at bars, or being killed in the streets. I felt heartbroken. I think I cried. Again, the sense of this like deep emotional distress at not seeing your community um, accurately, complexly represented. And also I want to point out here that Kelly was talking about a, a LGBTQ community archive, right? So community archives themselves can also be um, guilty of symbolically annihilated those, annihilating those on the margins within their own community, right? So I always have to remind myself and others that just because something's community-based doesn't make it liberatory necessarily. Um, so that's the bad news that we uncovered, right? That, that um, there's a lot of symbolic annihilation happening in archives. Um, the good news is that we found that community-based archives are often countering this kind of symbolic annihilation. And we developed this model, which I'll show you in a few slides, to sort of model what this impact is like. The first kind of impact um, we're calling ontological impact. And again, here's Kelly. I think the ability of our community members to see our lives represented or to see that there is a history and there are moments in our history that, although they haven't been made available, that are about life and love and things that are antithetical to what we know is out there already that we've witnessed, the police abuse, the death, all of this pain and violence, to create a living archive that really is about life while not excluding those moments I, I mentioned. Violence is consistently a part of our community's life. But just to be able to imagine otherwise, to see records that are life-affirming, I think would just be valuable for everyone. And this came up um, again and again in our interviews and focus groups that people said seeing yourself represented changes your way of being in the world. So a different participants in one of the SADA 
um, academic council interviews said that when she first discovered Sada, it was like suddenly discovering herself existing in the world, right? So ontology is your way of being in the world. It changes your way of being um, when you see that representation. The second kind of impact is epistemological impact. So epistemology is how do you know what you know? Um, and we found that community archives um, provided that proof or evidence that communities have been in existence in some cases for hundreds of years. So here's Annie Tang again saying, this kind of harken, harkens back to my earlier answer about how when you're a young person in this country and you don't see yourself represented elsewhere, there can be a lack of self-esteem and a lack of groundedness. And I feel that at least in this area of history, we can be grounded by being symbolic even. If it doesn't look like it has a lot of research value, let's say it's Chinese pottery from the 1800s from Los Angeles, and there's nothing even written on it. It's just clay shards. But that in and of itself is incredibly symbolic that we were here 200 years ago and we're not as foreign as a lot of Americans think we are. We've been here for a while and we're here now, right? So knowing that your community has been here, having that kind of evidence um, is really important and some, an important impact. And then finally, social impact, right? It builds community and also feelings of inclusion within the larger community to see yourself represented. So this is a quote from Pilar Castillo, um, who was working at the Social and Public Art Resource Center, which is an organization in Venice Beach that documents the history of Chicano murals. Um, well, I think ultimately archival work contributes to a better society because it involves seeing a reflection of yourself. So if you have a community and a city that's full of immigrants, Really, how do you create a really successful city or society? What bonds the people at that point? To be able to see a reflection of yourself in this foreign place, then you become more impassioned with it. You become more dedicated to it. You become a better citizen toward it. You have a mutual goal in creating a better society, a good society, right? Um, so again, it not only builds community within the group that is doing the archival collecting, but also larger feelings of inclusion. So based on all of these interviews and focus groups, um, we came up with this visual model. And as you can probably tell from it, I'm not a visual person since it's a simple Venn diagram. Um, but we have here um, emerging from this background of symbolic annihilation, the impact that community archives have. And the three kinds of impact, ontological, epistemological, and social, um, which we've also said uh, relate to the phrases, I am here, we were here, and we belong here. And where those three feelings of impact overlap, we're calling that representational belonging, which we defined as the ways in which community-based archives enable people who have been marginalized to have the power and authority to establish and enact their presence in ways that are complex, meaningful, substantive, and positive to them in a variety of symbolic contexts. So what, right? So that's the theory work, the empirical work and the theory work. Um, but I'm always interested, again, putting on my SADA hat and thinking about how do we translate these research findings into tangible outcomes for community archives. Um, and then the goal then became to create a toolkit to show how we have done this with SADA, right? So always using SADA sort of as my test case here. So um, as a result of that, out came the Assessing the Affective Impact of Community Archives, a toolkit, which you all have access to, and it's up on the Community Archives um, Lab site. And I just want to give a little shout out to Grayson Brillmeyer, who's one of my doc students, who's also a graphic designer, and they came up with the beautiful little graphics throughout um, the toolkit. Um, so the goals of the toolkit, um, it's to provide community archives with the tools to collect, analyze, and leverage stories about the emotional or affective impact of their organizations on the communities they serve and represent. By systematically interviewing stakeholders to find out how community archives are life-changing, organizations can collect useful data that can help articulate their value to potential funders and make strong cases for support, ultimately leading to increased budgets and capacity. Um, so I should say one of the biggest struggles with SADA or the biggest struggle has been fundraising. I think we're finally at a place where um, we're expanding. Um, Samip, who's the executive director, is now looking to hire a second person. Um, and we spend almost as much time fundraising as we do doing archival work. Well, fundraising is part of archival work, but um, the hands-on, you know, working with materials and donors and providing access to them. And so I'm always thinking about ways that my research can help um, increase our budget, right? And not just our budget, but other community archives as well. So um, 
we came up with this nine st- step plan here that's in the toolkit and I'll go through each one of these steps. And our goal was really to try to eliminate any barriers um, to doing empirical social science research um, so that anybody without you know, a PhD or a master's degree trained in how to do social science research could undertake projects like this. Um, so the first step is deciding roles and responsibilities. Um, it is a big commitment of uh, energy and labor and time um, to do this kind of, of work to demonstrate your impact. And so it's, it helps, particularly in organizations that are volunteer run, even if they're not volunteer run, everyone is completely overworked, right? So from the very outset, figuring out um, who's going to do what. So some of the key tasks are participant recruitment, conducting the interviews or focus groups, transcribing them, analyzing the transcripts writing a report, and then reporting those findings to those in leadership and development and marketing roles. Um, So it really helps from the outset to make it clear who is doing what. The second step is getting buy-in. So get stakeholders on board with the assessment process. Um, Propose your work plan to the board of directors, to staff, to volunteers, um, at board meetings or membership meetings, at events, at instruction sessions, and in one-on-one conversations. Basically, anyone who will listen to you, however you can get them to listen, talk to them about it. Um, You can also use social media if your organization has it. Um, And show them examples, right? So use the examples from the toolkit, right? Show them SADA's grant proposals or uh, SADA's projects to show why, you know, why you would undertake this much work in the first place. Um, The third step is deciding if you're going to do interviews or focus groups, and there are trade-offs and benefits of each one. So interviews are one-on-one conversations. Participants can express thoughts and feelings privately and at their own own pace. Um, It enables a more focused conversation with a single individual. So if somebody says something provocative, you can say, say more about that. Um, On the downside, it requires more time to set up and conduct Um, But it also has more flexibility in terms of it can be scheduled at the participant's convenience. Um, Focus groups, by contrast, are group discussions. So group dynamics can influence the tone, substance, length, and frequency of individual responses for better or worse. Sometimes there's a really toxic group dynamic, and sometimes participants feed off each other in a really great way in a focus group. It just sort of depends. Um, So it could be a richer discussion. Um, And it's in some ways easier because you're collecting your data sort of in one fell swoop um, from multiple participants in one to two hours, right? Whereas if you're interviewing 10 people, that's going to, you know, that might take you 10 hours of your time. Um, Step four is recruiting participants. So this can take many different forms. You can directly recruit participants in person via conversations, via reference interactions, or at events. You can also call and email your community members. You could create a recruitment flyer, and there's an example of that in the appendix of the toolkit, um, and post it so that people will come to you. Um, You can also post recruitment materials on social media. Um, But in all cases, make sure to respect the privacy of your community members and honor their right not to participate, right? So you want to make it very clear that um, there's no, um, you know, quid pro quo for them participating, that they're able to, you know, access materials or fully participate in the life of your organization, even if they don't participate in this particular research project. Um, And then you actually have to conduct the interviews and focus groups. And so one of the things that I think is most helpful in the toolkit is Appendix 2, which are the questions that we have asked in the interviews and focus groups. Um, And so you don't have to do that work, although certainly you are free to um, to modify um, those questions. Um, But those are the list of questions that we ask to generate our data. Step 6 is um, transcribing Um, the interviews or focus groups. So there are several different companies that will do this for you. Of course, course they charge to do that, right? Um, Other, uh, one student just suggested that there's a transcription software called Temi that will do this. I have not used Temi yet, but if any of you use it and like it, please let me know. I think in the future we'll try it out. You can also have staff or volunteers um, transcribe Um, uh, the recordings that you made. It's very labor intensive, but I found that it's actually helpful to transcribe um, some of the focus group data myself because you get a really detailed sort of close relationship 
with the data when you do the transcription. Um, no matter who does the transcription, make sure to double check the spellings of names um, because those the transcripts then become your guide. Um, and you want to make sure just from the start, everybody's name is spelled right. Step seven, analyze the interviews or focus groups. So um, working in a team of at least two people, assemble all of the transcripts in Word documents. Um, each team member should read through all the transcripts. And um, there is software such as InVivo that will help you do this kind of coding. Um, but for the toolkit, we tried to keep it as simple as possible. And so we're just using Microsoft Word, right? We're, um, we're not um, using anything more complicated than that. And what we did was just use insert new comment in Word to identify an important theme from the transcript. So after each team member has identified themes in all of the transcripts, the team should meet to compare the themes that they found and to develop a stand standardized vocabulary. Um, the transcript should then be recoded to reflect the words listed in the standardized vocabulary so that themes are consistently identified using the same words. Um, and then based on that standardized vocabulary, you can develop a list of important themes that arose from the transcripts. And those themes are your findings. Um, the quotes that are highlighted can be used as data or evidence to support your findings. And I have an example of this year. So this is um, an example of the list of themes that we determine from some of these interviews and focus group transcripts. So um, symbolic annihilation, identity, representation, and we abbreviated that to SA. So um, within SA, we had different subcategories, right? So disparity between mainstream media and community collections, disparity between mainstream archives and community collections, representational belonging or seeing yourself. Um, so these were all themes that emerged organically from the transcripts. Um, and so this is just our way of sort of all being on the same page, somewhat literally of being on the same page in how we're going to talk about those themes. Um, and then in the toolkit itself, there's an example, um, let's see, page um, 16. Um, no, is it before that? Sorry, page 13 of um, how we actually um, insert um, a theme using that insert comment function um, to code um, what, what people said with one of the themes. Um, so for example, on page 13, um, somebody said 50% of them say, I'm going to keep working there because I keep finding things because I keep learning things. And their t-shirts, they say, I've never seen all these t-shirts. It generates a type of excitement that they didn't know they actually had. And we coded that as being about emotional impact, excitement, right? So um, that's just an example of how, how we did that. Um, and then report your findings, right? So you can produce a written report. You can present what you found out um, to your own community, to the board of your own community. Um, and then most importantly for me is um, step nine, the final step, right, so why bother, in order to leverage those findings. And you can leverage what you found to create new projects, to develop outreach programs, to develop marketing materials, fundraising letters, and grant proposals. And I'm just going to very quickly go over some examples of that that are also in the toolkit. Um, so after this first round of research was done with the South Asian American academics who use SADA, um, SADA then went and applied for a grant from the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage, um, which we got. Um, and it was to convene a multidisciplinary cohort of artists for a year-long discovery process to investigate how collaboration between artists and archives might effectively counteract the symbolic annihilation of immigrant and minority communities. So you can see the way we're talking um, about our impact is already using the language um, that emerged from the research. Results of the discovery process will be shared with the public in a number of ways, including through a one-day capstone conference um, where the artists will present prototypes of new creative works. Um, so we used the research to develop the, the, um, the grant proposal and the project and the outreach activities um, for SADA. And the project itself was called Where We Belong, which was also clearly taken from the research and clearly taken from the quotes um, that the South Asian American academics who use SADA said that SADA was a place where they belonged, right? Um, this is a discussion guide that Samip, who's the executive director of SADA, created um, for the event. Um, this is also from the discussion guide. Um, and uh, 
he, it, this was a discussion guide that was used at the event, but then also is made available on the SADA, SADA website along with digital versions of the art, artist projects um, so that anybody, you know, in their home can follow along. Um, and there were, in fact, um, dozens of small groups that people organized in their homes um, to look at the art pieces together and then use this discussion um, uh, uh, material to start a community discussion in their own home. So that way the, um, the event was able to live on sort of across the country in multiple settings. Um, but all of this, again, drew on what we found in our um, interviews. So um, there's also an example in the toolkit of um, some language from the grant proposal as well um, that we use based on this research. So um, wrapping up some of the next steps, now that we have a toolkit, it's um, a beta version of the toolkit, and so we're testing it out. Um, I have a new first-year doctoral student named Ayantu Tabeso who's using the toolkit, um, just came onto the project, and the idea is that she has sort of no prior inner knowledge of the workings of the research team or of the community archives lab. And so she's sort of modeling what it would be like to just use the toolkit as someone who works for a community archive. Um, and she's doing that at three different sites at the Southeast Asia archive at UC Irvine at La Astoria and Lambda. Um, and based on what she finds, we'll tweak the toolkit. She's already told me that our interview protocol, that some of the questions um, could be reordered to flow better. So we're, we're going to be working on doing that. Um, if you use the toolkit, please let me know. I would love to hear if it worked, if it didn't work, what worked, what didn't. Um, and then we're publishing a series of articles. And also I'm working on a book um, about um, the impact of community archives. And so there's a list on the lab's website of um, some of the materials that have come out already. We just got an article accepted to Archivaria and another article accepted to Journal of Contemporary Archival Studies. So those will be out soon. I've talked a lot at you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. All of this was funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and additional support was provided by my dean's office for student funding. Um, are there any questions? I'm going to take a sip of coffee. Yes. Thank you so much, Michelle. You're welcome. It was a lot. Yeah, I love it, though. Um, it's <laughs> such a such a great project, such a great overview of it. So I am um, I'm making everyone, uh, I'm unmuting everyone. So you can ask questions, please. Uh, or you can, if you want to type them in the chat box, I'll um, ask them for you. So I know I, um, I'll start off. Please. It, yes. Uh, just sort of thinking about, I mean, you kind of address this a little bit, but, um, you know, when you talk about the definition of community archives and I need to, I once again, have it on my to-do list to like do way more reading and like pretty much read everything in your, um, bib, uh, or, you know, your further resources, yep. selected bibliography at the, in the toolkit. Yep. Yep. Um, but so, and, and you said that the, the main thing of defining a community archive is the participatoriness of it and yep. the um, autonomy. So yep. I know that a lot of us uh, in the um, network were some, some have archives of their communities and it's very regionally based. There might be also like uh, other parameters that yep. d deal with, um, I know that there are projects for some of our partners, I think like in Pueblo that focus on, marginalized communities uh, as well. So it, you can be considered a community archives even if your sort of the organization has aspects of collecting for marginalized uh, and underrepresented identities and things like that. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, it's a really good question that I think has not been fully resolved in the literature. Mm -hmm. um, but I always point to the Southeast Asia Archive at UC Irvine, which it's part of a university library. Absolutely. It's, you can't miss it. It's, um, when you go to the library, it's the first thing you see. It's really prominently located on campus. It gets its funding from the university. Um, but it's also very much community engaged. So the archivist there, Tui Vo Deng, is a member of the community. She has an advisory board um, of Southeast Asian Americans in the uh, Irvine area, um, and so who help make decisions about what to collect and how to describe it. 
Um, so I think it's still absolutely a community-based archive, even though it's part of the university. I think there are many cases, though, where community archives have antagonistic relationships with universities. I don't think that's true of public libraries, though. Um, but I think universities have a history and a present reality of often extracting labor and extracting resources from marginalized communities and not returning the benefits um, of that research to those communities. So often community-based archives see themselves in competition with university libraries, and they see university libraries as being much more funded um, and elitist, mm -hmm. right? Where even members of their own community are not welcome to access their own materials if they're placed there. Mm -hmm. But I think because the Memory Lab network is a network of public libraries, that is not um, the case, I think, with public libraries. I think many community-based archives feel like they're already in partnership with public libraries mm -hmm. um, because of your commitment to the public, right? right. Um, and so, um, and you know, also, I would also mention the June Mazer Lesbian Archive, um, which is uh, a community-based archive in West Hollywood that documents the history of lesbians in Southern California. Um, they're very much in partnership with the public government, with the city government of West Hollywood. They're, they rent their space for a dollar a year from the city of West Hollywood, right? So even though they're independent, um, they rely on public resources, right? Much in the same way that public libraries do. So um, again, it's not a hard and fast uh, designation between what is and what isn't. I think what all, a community archive, I think also what's key for me is this idea of marginalization. So I teach a community-based archives class and I start out the class, the very first session, and asking my students, after we've read several different definitions of community archives, is the Beverly Hills Historical Society a community-based archive? Mm. Um, because it really gets at um, these definitions, right? So is, if it's not a marginalized identity, is it a community-based archive? I personally think the answer is no. Um, but I'm willing to listen to other arguments that it is, right? And I think the, that... Um, the academic research on community-based archives is really recent. Um, it's only within the past, you know, 10, 12 years that academic archival study scholars have paid any attention to community-based archives. And so these definitions are shifting and changing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's not a hard and fast rule until I write an article that makes it a hard and fast rule. Yeah. And um, as long yeah. as the Beverly Hills Historical Society collects, like, things, like, about the slums of Beverly Hills and what. <laughs> Well, you know, it's interesting, though, because a lot of historical societies exist um, to actually maintain white supremacy, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of historical societies are about white people trying to control the narrative of the, his the white history of that particular area, mm -hmm. um, and which seems to me like very opposite from the goals of a community-based archive. But again, that's all, it's all open for discussion. Right. And that's also where there's so much overlap with community archives um, and personal archives um, that like, yeah, the, and that's where Memory Lab, you know, kind of sits in that yep. <laughs> Venn diagram, you know, like, because right. there is that we want to give people the tools and equipment and knowledge to preserve themselves and yep. to not have to, real, you know, to not have to, like, donate, you know, yep. and to yep. really do it themselves. Um, but then also it helps connects them, too, potentially to um, other places. It's just, like, giving people options. I feel like that's yep. – and, 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 and for, you know, empowering them to be like, yes, you should preserve your story. You matter. You're, yep. you know – yeah. Seeing the, the concept of like seeing yourself in history, which is an impact in and of itself, right? If people feel like they um, participate in a memory lab program and they see themselves in history, that is a huge, um, amazing impact, right? Mm -hmm. that, that needs to be documented and leveraged. You could raise a lot of money by saying we allow people, we enable people, empower people to see themselves in history. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes that means quite literally seeing yourself in history, right? So it might... It might mean someone who looks like you, but it also might mean you mm -hmm. or your grandmother, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so there is that absolute connection between the personal and the community, right? So um, and I think that has been interesting to see, at least through the SADA work, to see people realize, oh, their own personal story matters and is part of history. Mm -hmm. So I didn't mention this, but some of the participatory projects that SADA has 
we have a project called First Days, which um, is uh, empowers immigrants from anywhere in the world, not just South Asia, to create really brief narratives about their first 24 hours in the U.S. Some of them are video narratives, some are written, some are um, audio. It just completely depends. And then we have another project called the Road Trips Project, which is about South Asian Americans documenting the history of, of road trips in, as a, in the United States as a way to reclaim um, territory in, in this American tradition. And both of those projects enable people, again, to see li- quite literally see themselves mm-hmm. um, in history. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's also why I I feel like I'm regular, regularly hitting the uh, network over the head with um, Home Movie Day. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but that is a great public program that fits into the memory lab because you're having people digitize their home movies, at least on VHS. Um, yeah. and that is one where people are literally seeing themselves. Um, but then also, you know, seeing people who look like them or it, it and people that look like them, but that are, you know, maybe celebrating a different religion, but like, yeah seeing like, you know, a Hanukkah celebration next to a Christmas, next to a Kwanzaa or other, you know, um, it really is super powerful. And the commonalities and the differences, um, really fun. Yeah, it's so interesting. You should mention that. I'm going to pull up the slide. So um, this slide right here from our uh, Where We Belong Artist Project so the still on the bottom right is from a home movie of, of um, Sharanjit Singh Dillon, who came to the U.S. in 1956 from India um, to study engineering, chemical engineering at the University of Oklahoma and got married to a white woman um, who you see there. And we have these silent home movies of their wedding that are incredible to see. And um, that every time we show them, people start crying. South Asian Americans start crying because it's from 1956 in Norman, Oklahoma, right? Like not a time that you're used to seeing many representations of South Asians in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And so as part of our project, one of the artists, whose name is Zain Alam, who's up in the upper corner there, um, he created a score for that home movie. Um, so Zane is Muslim. It's a Sikh wedding ceremony. Mm-hmm. It didn't matter mm-hmm. to him, right? What, you know, he was able to create this in, and I, it's available on the Sada website. I recommend everybody. It's just incredibly moving. He remixed the footage, um, of the home movie as well and sort of put it into conversation with, um, contemporary, um, stories about uh, Islamophobia and hate crime, right, um, against Sikh communities, but also South Asians more generally. Um, but it didn't matter to him, right, that it wasn't exactly his religion. It's still mm-hmm. someone who he perceived to look like him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I want to make sure everyone else has, because you know me, I always have a million questions. So um, if anybody has anything before I ask my next question. Um, so what do you, uh, oh yeah. What do you think about, um, asking about sending, let's say you want to do like, let's say you have like two staff members that do everything. Yeah. Imagine that Barry. (laughs) Um, and you know, you want to like still get something out of your community, um, in this like qualitative way, what do you think about taking the questions and emailing them or asking people to maybe do a Google form and do like an anonymous or they can opt in or out sort of thing on their own time? Yeah, that's certainly better than nothing. And I think it just depends on how people communicate. Right. So I know I personally am much more articulate in writing that I am speaking. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for me, I, and if I'm motivated, I might take the time on my own time to fill out something like that. Um, I think in general, social science researchers say that um, one-on-one conversations or in-person conversations are much more important and effective at eliciting um, emotional language, right? And we're actually finding that out right now because a lot of the interviews that Ayantu, to be so the doctoral students testing the toolkit, um, is doing are interviews that are occurring over the phone. And she's realizing that she's not, um, it's more difficult to make a personal connection with someone over the phone than in person, mm. right? Because in person, they see her, they can see what her facial expressions are. Um, they, there's more of a sense of trust. Mm-hmm. But if you're talking to people you already know, who already trust you, then that barrier wouldn't be there. Um, But it would be really interesting to see what kind of data you could solicit 
um, if you did this online only. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, again, it's hard through um, like a survey is really good at getting the quantitative and not so good at getting the qualitative unless people are motivated or have the incentive to really spend time yeah. to share. And also, I guess, as I like asked it, I was like, oh, uh, <laughs> you know, anyone who might not if English wasn't their first language or or yeah, they might not feel comfortable doing a written thing. So, you, yeah, you want to get as many people. If as anybody um, is using the toolkit, by the way, in a, and is translating the interview pro- protocol into a different language, I would love to share that. So oh, that's that would great. be really cool. To yeah. Do that. Cool. Um, yeah, because a lot of communities, English is not their first language, mm-hmm. yeah, obviously. Cool. Anyone else? Questions? Questions? What was my next one? Oh. It's, you know, the toolkit, it's really meant to be used, and it's like condensing a lot of information into 20 pages. Mm-hmm. And so I really would like to, if you use it in any way, or if you read it and decide like, this is too much, I'm not going to use it. I really would like that feedback because mm-hmm. that's important feedback. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Got it. I sort of already asked this a little bit before we started recording, but um, so, you know, as I was mentioning that our memory lab, the DC public libraries memory lab did this sort of thing. Um, at at various levels at the beginning of like when we and this is what you guys I'm I'm going to insist that you all um do a questionnaire of some sort that will uh we can maybe think through together um but you really should uh gather this information in in your first coming um you know when as you first open Um, but then it'll help you with your, you know, workflows and how you document things as well. But then, so we did that for our our memory lab, but now it's been two, three years. How often do you think, and you know, this is probably maybe, you know, depends on the organization or whatever. How often do you think that it is, um, appropriate to maybe do this sort of thing annually? I can't imagine doing it more than annually, but I think too much work to even do annually. Mm -hmm. I know it's been, what, four years since we did the interviews with the Academic Advisory Council for SADA, and we're still getting a lot of mileage out of it. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. (laughs) You know, I, like, want to ring the data because it takes so much time to collect and analyze the data, like, ringing out everything we can get out of it, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know, maybe every um, few years. And I think it also depends if you're assessing the impact of a particular program, that also is grant funded and you have the pressures of demonstrating to the grant funder on their timeline, what your impact is. Yeah. I think that's different than just, um, you know, a, a more general sense of trying to market an organization. Yeah. Right. We're still using quotes, <laughs> um, from four years ago on SADA's fundraising letters and on our website and in marketing materials. Um, it would be interesting. I think we'll do, a, um, maybe another round this coming year of interviews not just with academics, um, because that's a very specific group, but we might do one with like um, high school students, for mm-hmm. example, or college students or activists or artists, right? So tr- trying to figure out like, who do you want to market your services to? And then figuring out, you know, what is what is their language for talking gotcha. about impact? Mm-hmm. And do you, yeah, where would you document that I mean, you know, you have your questions, you have your answers. Um, Where would you document, like, I guess your selection criteria of who you're, uh, you know, uh, going out and getting, recruiting? Yeah. Yeah. That's a crucial part of the report. Um, Whatever report you write, whatever presentation you do, if you publish an article about it, there needs to be much more research on impact um, in general and community archives impact in general. So, um, I would really encourage you if you go through all this work to also publish it, um, so that others, including myself can learn from, from what you did and that, you know, in the methods section, right. There's always sticklers who review articles and need to know, like, how did you get your sample and how did you, you know, select these people and, um, being crystal clear about that so that others can learn from it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it doesn't have to be perfect to everybody. Like, no, oh I know no. you hear, I, I personally hear like methods and Ooh, then I'm just like, Oh my God, I got to <laughs> no. I think just being transparent as possible. Yeah. 
yeah. convenient sample. You know, uh-huh. like these are the words that we use to mitigate from those hardcore social scientists who are like, this is bias. Like, of course, it's always going to be biased. Yeah. We're not claiming that it's not. Mm-hmm. We use a convenient sample. We're trying to generate thick description, generate theory about a phenomenon about which little is known. We're not saying that it's representative of all of anybody. You know, yeah. there are those kinds of yeah. qualifiers. And actually, I'm interested in the scholarship, but only in as much as it actually helps organizations do their work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so whatever works for you and your particular organization. That's great. Yeah. And that was actually, there was one little thing of that I was wondering about. Um, oh, and so one thing I was thinking was maybe like if people do strategic planning every like five to seven years or whatever they do, so maybe yeah. wrap that into it. Yeah. Um, but, oh yeah, it was like in step one in the toolkit. Yeah. Okay. It says... I'm guessing I was just sort of like, ooh, I'm not sure. It says we estimate that at least 40 hours of labor are needed to complete the following steps. So that's yes. just for step one or for all of the steps? For all of them. Okay. Because I was like, I'm such a hierarchy person. Like, I'm like, oh, it just belongs in step one. It's just right. so, okay. <laughs> so that's good for me to know. Thank you for that. Because sure. then we can clarify that. Um, in the next iteration of the toolkit. No, it, it takes you 40 hours to decide who's doing what, then you have deep organizational issues. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, no, who knows? Hours, a minimum for the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But that, that, that's very helpful to know. Thank cool. you. Um, anybody else have any questions? Because I'm out. <laughs> Do you guys see yourselves um, I mean, you're going to, like, I think that this is a really important part of capturing information and data that we'll have to bring back to IMLS. It's very helpful that this is also IMLS funded project. Yeah, it helps me to go back to IMLS yeah. and say, look. Yeah. Exactly. So, and, you know, I've taken a look at IMLS has a bunch of great documents online too, about like evaluating programs and things like that. Um, but it's kind of overwhelming. It's kind of a lot of information to sift through too and I was sort of like oh I want to pick like the best ones and this is just like getting to that there's also just like so much out there written about like this type of like qualitative you know not not just numbers data and how it's important but no one has actually said like how that I've read yet no one had actually said like here's how you go about doing it you know, it's yep. like, just make sure that you capture it. And then it's like, oh, okay, but yeah. how do I and do that? Just, this, as we were chatting before, Sada just had this big event at UCLA this past weekend. And it was by Cal, uh, the California Humanities Council. And so they have their own evaluation form that we were required to pass out at the end of the event to elicit evaluations. And the information that we got was not that helpful. I mean, it was things like how... Based on this project, how likely are you to attend another program sponsored by California Humanities? Very likely, not very likely. It's like, we know that, but there was no real space for people to say, like, this program changed my life. Like, I never saw myself represented until today. Or, yep. Yep. Um, you know, I feel part of a bigger community now. There just wasn't that kind of opportunity for engagement. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know it takes, and, and you know, that was very easy. We just printed it out from Calhoun. It took five minutes to administer. Here's the survey. Here's some golf pencils, right? But the kind of data wasn't that great. Whereas I think this takes more time, but the kind of data you get is much more useful. Mm-hmm. Yes, definitely. And I know that those types of evaluations, typically we are, we, the, the network, says, you know, give them after every time you have a class, ask people to fill them out. So then you can kind of hone the class to what your community needs. But, um, and yeah, you don't want to make them too long, but then, yeah, this seems like a bigger picture kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm just trying, I'm also trying to just be a big advocate for community archives and any that they can raise money so that they can preserve their own autonomy. That's what I hope is the ultimate goal. Yes. I uh, cannot agree more. Um, I think that there's, uh, I really need to memorize this statistic, but I know that Clear like released a report a few years ago that said something like public libraries 
have like 92% of public libraries in the U S have unique records of their communities. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think I've, I've heard that, um, and said that at libraries and archives conferences and talks and people are shocked and it's sort of like, yes, Public libraries are community archives, too. Yeah. Public libraries understand community archives mm-hmm. way better than academic archives do. For mm-hmm. academic archivists, all of the community engagement is completely foreign, whereas this is the bread and butter of public libraries. It's a much more natural partnership mm-hmm. between community archives and public libraries 100%. than academic libraries. Although academic libraries, they should... I think it's really it's rewarding, good. and they should use this as well So yeah. and connect with their... Uh, public libraries, community archives. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts on how you might use this? I um, will, I will be definitely following up on this. I'm probably going to take the questionnaire at the end. So you guys should all read it. I, I know I haven't really given you homework, but I, I really think that this should be homework is reading it. I'll send the link again. Um, and I'm probably going to take in appendix two is the questions, um, yep. suggested questions, uh, and whatever, um, your grads, uh, or your, um, stu- sorry, I don't, I want to get it right. Your dissertation, uh, student, right? Yeah. Assistant that, um, whatever they have learned about the order of the questions, I'd love to implement yep. Great. Now, um, so yeah. that then we can, you know, obviously, like, we'll just say, how do you, how did you come to the memory lab? How often, you right. know, like, so that will right. be, um, yeah. we'll, we'll tweak it for our uses. And then yeah. um, I really, really want to encourage everyone to, to use it. It doesn't have to be this huge scale of a thing. But I really think that especially you should do a focus, some focus groups, potentially. I know that, um, like Aaron, um, had a group, a big group of people that they trained and we're going to be the first users. Um, so that could be a, a great automatic sort of thing to send out and be like, and that's where you recruit people who are already your power users and your, um, uh, people who are really, really interested in the memory lab, um, and like are invested, uh, I think so that you can just get, get, having any, you know, something rather than nothing on, on this end is really, really important to, for us to take back to IMLS and to also learn for our second cohort that will be, um, and use, uh, you know, in order to recruit people to apply for that as well. Um, so yeah, it's just going to be very useful. So thank you so much, Michelle. I want to make sure that everyone still has time for questions because we are so lucky to have you with us um and um i guess if we have any other burning follow-up questions uh i can always email you email me you can okay. tweet at me too great Prefer caz caz <laughs> great on twitter thank you so much it's been so exciting to thank talk to all you. of you and i really want to hear how you use it yes we will absolutely be getting back to you on that great Cool. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful week.